Uh, it, it's my uh, pleasure that, uh, this evening to uh, uh, introduce to everybody and bring to our campus Dr. Ronald Cantor. Uh, we had actually sent out all of his uh, Vita and uh, uh, bio, uh, biography information earlier on the website. That's still available on the, the website, so I won't go through all of that. Uh, format for this evening is that uh, he'll uh, talk to us with an introductory statement. Uh, following that, uh, that the uh, folks that are in attendance would be able to uh, ask questions uh, of Dr. Cantor. Um, we have a feedback form to compile uh, information. That information will go to uh, Jenny Wang, who's the director of, of IR, who will kind of synthesize and, and uh, compile all of the uh, feedback that's provided by uh, folks on campus. This is also be, uh, being televised on WebEx, so there are some folks that have begun to, to chime in uh, online uh, to hear uh, Dr. Cantor's uh, remarks this evening. And so uh, we've allocated up to an hour and a half uh, tonight for, uh, for this session. And so uh, we have uh, one of the individuals who will be dropping Dr. Cantor off. So we'll ask that we wrap up at right at or a little bit before 8.30 uh, so that we can get him back to his hotel uh, this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ron Cantor. Thank you very much. First of all, feel free calling me Ron. I hope everyone does. My goal is to make people feel comfortable. My goal is to make people feel comfortable enough that they say and ask whatever it is that they need to, in all candor, because I know there are many, many good people doing many, many good things for many years here and at the other colleges. And I also know it's a time of transition and a time of anxiety and a time when not everyone agrees. And I want you to to be candid with me, ask me anything you want. Follow up, disagree with me, whatever it might be. So very briefly, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Well, technically, I was the first person to graduate from college. My father did go to several colleges for a very short period at each one. And uh, as he said, he majored in uh, gin rummy and, uh, <laughs> and never came close to graduating. So I was the first one to graduate from college. Uh, College was such a wonderful experience for me. It opened my eyes academically, interpersonally, culturally, diversity-wise, opportunity, horizons, all of it. I loved the experience so much that I never left. I've been at colleges and universities my whole career. I've continued to learn a lot from students, from faculty, from staff, from community partners, and many others. The microphone is working, right? It's a long day, my voice isn't as strong as it was, and I'm drinking tea. I want to make sure you can hear me. So wave your arms if you have trouble. Uh, I started my career in student affairs, gradually moved over to academic affairs, then campus administration. I, for seven years, I was dean of a branch campus. And the politics, culture, and dynamics between the main campus and the branch campus informs in some ways, not all and not on the same scale, but in some ways I think some of what you're wrestling with now. Then I had the ultimate dream of my career come true. I became a president in 2011, president of Southern Maine Community College in Maine. Wonderful campus, wonderful people. I loved it for so many reasons and I thought I'd be there till the end of my career. Anything I say, I'm going to do in shorthand, and you can feel to ask questions, and I'll elaborate. My family moved to Maine with me. The presidency was everything for me personally and professionally I dreamed of. For my wife especially, it wasn't. She had grown up in a small town in upstate New York, and uh, only child. Her parents were aging. After two, three, four years of my wonderful presidency, she said, can you look for jobs elsewhere? maybe back in New York. And I said, no. <laughs> I love it here. I love this job. It's what I always wanted. And I resisted. A little more time went, but she's a good trooper. She tried. But she didn't really want to stay in Maine. Then, unfortunately, we've had some, uh, some serious illness. She, she had, has a serious illness. We had some life-threatening experiences, uh, extensive time uh, uh, in the hospital and intensive care on life support. We didn't know if she was going to make it. Fortunately, she survived, and she recuperated and rebuilt her strength, and she's doing pretty well. Once she regained her strength, it only redoubled her eagerness to be back home in, in upstate New York. Once she could walk and drive on her own, which took 
some rehabilitation, but once she got there, she was gone and she was spending more time back in upstate New York than, than in Maine. And uh, while I was dealing with my wife's illness and so much else, the people in Maine were so good to me. I think uh, uh, some people from Connecticut were on, uh, including here tonight, were, were on my, my NIAS team just less than a year ago and saw what was uh, uh, going on in there. While I was going through all that turmoil, the people in Maine were so good to me. They said, do you want to take a leave of absence? A semester, a year, put an intern present in place, et cetera. I said, no, two things. Number one, work keeps me sane. Don't take my work away from me as I'm dealing with everything that kept me sane. And two, when I realized that, I really, that, that the change for my family needed to be more permanent, I just realized, OK, seven years was good. We're into eight now. And rather than take a leave of absence, I, when I got the courage to say it needs to be a little a, a more permanent change, uh, then uh, we worked out this wonderfully generous situation where I'm in transition. And I'm still working for the Maine Community College System, largely remotely, dealing with, with, uh, my, with my, my family issues, uh, getting everyone stabilized, which things are going quite well. My wife's health is, is holding steady. I'm getting too, more into it than I thought of. It, it's tired, and I'm, uh, I'll shut up in a second. But she, uh, she gave up her career when we moved. She really wanted to. Then she wanted, once she got sick, she wanted to go back to her career. She's back in her career. She's made her move. We're more stabilized now. OK. Maine is too far away if she's in, in New York State. I've been looking at opportunities, some in New York State, just like she always wanted. Uh, some of those opportunities are about the same distance driving as they are to here. This opportunity came up. I'm like, I can drive that, many, that much time to get home every weekend, every other weekend, whenever I could work it in and, and have a, a two family. So that's what originally opened me to the possibility. People ask me if I'm crazy coming into a situation like this. The answer is at least half I am. Uh, I, under, I don't have all the answers. I hear hornet's nest. I hear all kinds of descriptions, and I think they're all true. But I also know that I'm a person, and my DNA is transition and change, cultural and otherwise. And I'm all about helping organizations work through change and try to recognize the values, sometimes competing and conflicting values, and help everybody work together in order to make tough, difficult transitions the best they possibly can be, which is never complete for everybody. But that's, you get it. That's what I have to say to kick off. Ask me anything you want. Yes? Um, so, hi, I'm Marie Bage. I'm the director of the Academic Success Center. Um, and um, as you mentioned, you know, there's only disagreement about the position and Speak up? Okay. Um, so um, what I'm wondering is, how would you balance um, the need to sort of ease your way into the role? Because as you pointed out, there's disagreement, there's people who are opposing, and not just that it exists, but also maybe even that it's been sure to fill. Um, so balancing that with, certainly you have to get in there, you have to you know, take assume the leadership role, and, be effective and um, provide some of the structural changes that need to occur. You know, how do you balance that in a way that is effective? You walk right in. You listen to a lot of people. You try to walk in their shoes. You you ask them for their input, but more than that, you engage. You try to develop as much sensitivity and understanding as you can of how it all looks from their perspective. You bounce it off them and other people, and you refine it. Someone earlier today said, you're walking into the middle of all this, and they meant chronologically, time-wise, and they were worried about the time frame. I said, I'm walking into the middle of this in more ways than just chronologically. I don't have positions, you know. Uh, uh, not that I won't develop some, but any position I develop, any, any inkling, you know, uh, if people are disagreeing. It's not that I don't believe, and especially in this situation, from everything I've sensed, listened to, read, heard, researched, watched, this is too much of a yes versus no, right versus wrong, uh, all or nothing, win-lose, set up for a win-lose situation. I think it has to be a win-win situation, at least to a significant degree. I can't think it can be, I don't think everybody's going to be happy. I think that people are feeling that they're 
uh, their good work, their values, and the values of their colleges are at risk. They think that consolidation or students first, however you put it, is going to take away the important, the important identity and, uh, uh, and characteristics and priorities and strengths and value of individual campuses. I don't believe that's necessary. My point is, I've heard things on all sides phrased pretty blatantly, and I recognize there's questions of trust as well as skepticism, communication, uh, input not being listened to, lack of opportunity for input, and, and all that, that sort. But I walk into the middle, and I'm reaching to both sides. And I honestly, so far, I, I've been at a disadvantage in every room I've been in. And all of you know I think that this is my fifth college today. Some of you know that it's my 12th college in Connecticut. This is number 12 of 12. Some of them it was there's various degrees I've picked up on this issue, and I am walking into the middle. Uh, the reason I mention how many of them is in every room I've been in, I've been the one who's known the least about how it really works. And I'm at a disadvantage there so far. That's why I have to get to know so many people on different campuses and in different communities around the campuses and understand how it looks from their perspective. And I know it looks very different in the system administration and the legislators and the governor and the business partners and the foundations and, every, uh, and the students and the prospective students and whoever else. I walk into the middle, I reach for both sides, and I, I, I just absolutely cannot accept a yes or no, a winner and a lose. We have to find ways to win. Because guess what? I don't know anybody who doesn't support the good values of higher education and the services and the outlook and everything else that we invest in students and communities. That has to continue. I don't know of anyone, it sounds like people don't buy or don't accept or don't believe that there are restraints uh, or constraints that the world is changing demographically, culturally, technologically, financially, politically, in every way, shape, and form. And it means that the resources are not there. And we have accreditors telling us that on the whole, I've heard it from many colleges, oh, my college is stable financially, it's those other ones. Uh, or my college is okay with it, on and on. Guess what, I've heard that at a lot of colleges. It, okay, it's all in perspective. But when you walk in the middle, you realize that there are some real issues, and as the accreditors point out, there are problems with sustainability uh, financially and student success-wise and equity-wise, et cetera. The status quo cannot continue unless campuses close, et cetera. There's a plan for an alternative. People don't, we can talk about top-down, everything else, I'm beginning to ramble. Um, but I understand so far everything, what I'm, I understand only the pieces of it, but what I'm understanding has at least two sides. And I empathize with both sides, and I want to find ways to work it out. Because that's all that can be, because we can, it, it can't be a win-lose. Yes. Hi, Dave Cedar. Um, zero sum mentality can be very difficult uh, to change. Especially in a shrinking pie. Yes. How do you do that? How do you, how do you change that way of thinking? Reframe. You can't shut that. Well, one is, as I said, try to help people feel more safe and more secure. Try to feel pe help people feel respected and listened to. How do you do that? genuinely respect them and listen to them. I'm not sure there's been enough of that. I respect, so far I respect everybody, in, everybody involved. And I need to listen a lot more. But when, there be, when it becomes a zero sum game and fighting over a shrinking pie, that can't be. I mean, I've been there in, in colleges and universities when, ooh, my department doesn't have, has an enrollment problem. If I just can get this major passed and do this, I can steal 10 students from that other department. Wonderful. Whether it's students or budget or anything else, that, that we're fighting a zero sum and we're rearranging deck chairs. We've got to grow the pie. You can grow the pie the Benjamin Franklin way, penny saved is a penny earned. You can grow the pie creatively, through partnership and collaborations. And I don't, for an instance, think that you're not already doing these things. And you're doing them with passion and innovatively and creatively. I know you are. I believe that through regionalization, some additional opportunities for partnership and collaboration can emerge that can help grow the pie. No, it doesn't mean it brings in millions of dollars if you simply 
if you flip a switch. It's not that easy. But when you begin to look at things differently, when colleges or campuses are working together on some strategic priorities, I think we need, as I said in a small group earlier today, regional strategies that, that uh, value distinctive campus communities. There, it's not an oxymoron. Strategies of, of, of distinct and special, unique campuses choosing to come together to go after regional strategies. Regional strategies might involve regional employers, might involve statewide employers, uh, might involve an employer that sits next to one college but, and has some needs that that college is doing exceptionally well and the college it sits next to should be the one filling those needs when any number of colleges could do it. I understand geography. But if there are needs that that college can't completely meet for that employer or that community, then there's a strategic partnership that's necessary. So again, I'm not accusing people of being overly competitive and issues of turf. I'm not hearing a lot of that. If I were, that would be an easier answer. But uh, I'm not hearing that. But still, reframing, not as a win-lose, not as a fixed pie or shrinking. That's really a shrinking pie. But reframing that there's got to be some creative opportunities. How many industries have been reframed? Just this morning, I heard on the TV, because before dawn, there were a few minutes before I got picked up. <laughs> and I heard that the last of the blockbusters were closing, or somebody corrected me that there's still one left. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, whatever. There used to be 9,000. Did we give away movies when, when we gave away blockbuster? No. There's still movies. A better example that I think is a little more parallel to the world we live in. If you're old enough like me to remember Walter Cronkite, and uh, David Brinkley and Eric Severide and all those white males who everybody trusted to deliver the evening news. And they were professional and, and they were voted the most trusted in America year after year. And they tried to be objective and balanced and there was quality. What do we have today for news? We've got people yelling past each other and, we, we, and people think it's news. We lost the quality, the integrity too much. We blew that one. What was going on? Technological changes and lifestyle changes. No more three networks. First there was cable, then there's streaming and the internet and everything else. Making those platform and technological changes and adjustment did not mean we had to throw out the baby with the bathwater. It would have been and should have been possible. Maybe they shouldn't have continued to be all white males, but we could still have that journalistic integrity informing our citizenry. But we don't to any reasonable degree anymore. Similarly, I think there are a lot of people who have integrity and commitment and professionalism and are having excellent results, just like the old-time newscasters in the work that they do on their campuses and in their communities, in the classroom and beyond. And we have to preserve that. The platforms are changing. The finances are different. The demographics are different. The values are different. Certainly the technology is different. And it's caused some real threats to our entire system. So we do have to change the platforms and the formats and the packaging and everything else. But we don't have to give up the integrity, those values that are most dear to us. We have to do it better than the shift made in, in TV news. And I think we can if we have regional strategies that respect distinctive campus communities and more. All the good values of academia, pedagogy, academic freedom, shared governance, things like that. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jerry Murphy. I teach accounting here. Uh, I was also a student here 41 years ago, which I love mentioning. So I know what it's like to be on both sides. Uh, as an accounting professor, I have some concerns, but I'm not panicking that I'll get fired or lose my job because you will be accounting faculty. Uh, my main question has to do with I'm also the chair of the planning review committee here. And in fact, we are just in the home stretch of wrapping up our new strategic plan for the years and the committee has been working with Dr. Harris and many of the uh, folks here, the good people here. And my concern is what's going to happen? <coughs> here we are the strategic plan which is designed for our unique school and you said you've been to all 12 schools and colleges and I'm sure all 12 colleges will also tell you that you know we are a unique institution. My concern now is what's going to happen when we have a regional vice president Will you respect our strategic plan? Uh, will it get thrown out? Will you try to impose 
views, your views on it. I'm just curious your thoughts on it. Those are a lot of extremes and absolutes. <laughs> will I respect it? Yes. Will I throw it out? No. Will I help? Will I try to work with you and others to make that strategic plan inform whatever the next iteration is, be it campus-wide, system-wide, region-wide, whatever it might be? Uh, you know, something tells me it's like, uh, uh, it's like families go through transitions. There's divorces, there's deaths, there's all sorts of things. Children grow up, and sometimes family come back, come back, families come back with different configurations than what they started with remarriages, whatever, partnerships, whatever it might be. Sometimes it's more obvious or radical uh, or extreme than in others. Uh, the fact that regionalization is happening, the fact, and some of you might say, no, it's not, it's going to be stopped. Okay. Uh, but the fact is, it looks like there's a good chance it's going to happen, and there's a lot of forces pushing for it, and it's at the same time a lot of pushing against it. Me doesn't mean that, that your first marriage was meaningless doesn't mean that your older children who are growing out of the house uh, were only practice and your, your second family with your new kids. Uh, yeah, does one inform the other? You bet. I hope we learn to be better parents and spouses and partners and everything. And I believe in flexible changes in families and you go with the flow and you make it the best you can. And you know, other people, my grandmother was one of them. No, that's bad. They never should have gotten married. The baby. Uh, I can hear my grandmother saying that when I was a kid. Uh, there's not a right and wrong there. But there is accept the inevitable, but that doesn't mean entirely. It means take all the good you already have and have had, your contributions. They are not dismissed. They are not nullified. They're going to inform the next iteration in ways you know, you see, and you don't know and see. So I've been there. I, I mean, at one time when I was dean of a branch campus, they did a camp, they, they did a college master plan, which meant the main campus. And I said, hello. And they said, OK, yeah, we'll do a little one for you, too, separately. No, no, no. When I became a president and I had a main campus and a branch campus, we did a unified college-wide master plan. Doesn't mean consolidation and take away the identity. It helped us understand the identity and how they fit together. So respect those plans doesn't mean that everything on that plan can happen. Guess what? I, I, I have a colleague who's done master plans at hundreds of colleges. Uh, he's a campus planner. And uh, one of the great things he said to make me feel better as a president was, uh, no college does everything on its master plan. I feel better now. I didn't know where the money was going to come from, everything else. Uh, what they do takes place over a long, long time. And guess what? It changes as soon as it's printed. So the good work informs the future. Don't throw it out. Can't throw it out. But that doesn't mean you can keep it and protect it from the, the new and the different. It's a process, just like a family. I see one over here. Let's go over here first. Okay. My name is Cheryl Lee. I'm with the nursing department. I have read about the universities of Maine consolidation plan, and I was curious if you were part of that, and what could you bring from that process that's going to show us what we're going through? Because then you told your story, but I'm wondering, were you actually downsized out of no. that? No. In Maine, there are two separate systems. University system with seven universities and a separate community college system with a different board, a different ent entity entirely of seven community colleges reporting to that board. Uh, the consolidations, big and small attempts and successful and partial whatever, was all with the university system. Community colleges, there was no consolidation. Every couple of years, a legislator or two introduces a bill to put them under one board or something like that, and it never gets a lot of traction. That's the cl closest to anything like that. So I, I watched from the outside, or connected to the universities in some ways, but I was with the community colleges. So I could, to speak to what I've observed and what I learned, and one of them is uh, I'm glad it's being done a little bit more deliberately up front uh, here. And uh, I'm hoping, and I know people would disagree, and this is a, a contentious issue, uh, to be able to be done openly, deliberately, transparently, so that people can have input, et cetera. Yes? What challenges do you see that need to be addressed within the region? Huh. How do you sustain all the good that you're doing? Or at least the priorities? 
given the demographics, the economics, the changing nature of so much. Just sustaining, I mean, you know, there's no shortage of people who want to suggest new programs and new ventures and new partnerships. Many of them are good. And maybe there's some things we're doing that we shouldn't do anymore, but I don't think there's a lot of it. I think there might be a lot of things being done that could be done a little differently, both effectively and efficiently. Uh, and I'm not thinking of anything in particular, but my sense is that that's a lot about what this movement is about so that we can, you know, you know as a historian, I don't know if it's the right time to, to bring this up, but I think about the criticisms and the support for Franklin Roosevelt, who introduced the New Deal. And some said that Roosevelt destroyed capitalism. At the time, a lot of people were saying he's destroying capitalism, which is the American way of life. And oh my god, you've got to stop that socialist. He's going to destroy all the institutions that are dear to America. And there are other people, especially afterwards, who astutely observed that he didn't destroy capitalism. He saved capitalism. Because the threat was so large that unless significant structural changes were made, capitalism wasn't going to survive in the United States at the time of the Great Depression. So I think there's some parallels here. I think what we need to do is to figure out together how to not do away, just like I did with the broadcast news analogy, not to do away with what's most important, but to find ways to sustain what is most important. But we have to do it differently in some new ways. And that's where I think there are some opportunities. Did I get at your question, or is there you want to take another pass? OK. Yes. You seem like you're a quick study <sighs> Are you asking about how it feels on the inside or what it looks like on the outside? <laughs> I'm told over and over again what you just said. I confessed a few minutes ago that I'm at a disadvantage in every one of these rooms I walk into because you know it better than I do, and I'm going inside, oh my god, you know, let alone all the acronyms and all the different colleges uh, and everything else, but what is most important, and, and it's just all flying, and I'm picking it up, and I'm grasping pieces of it here and there, and that's growing. Uh, but I always feel, to be very honest, it's a challenge for me. But I guess I pull it off OK, or so people tell me. And people tell me that. I've got a way of grasping and articulating the big picture without losing the important emphasis on the details. And especially the word articulating comes up a lot in the feedback I receive, that I can articulate the complex problems in a way that makes sense to people, and they begin to break, can begin to break them down and understand them and prioritize and focus on pieces. Um, and uh, sometimes they throw in, that keeps me on my toes. or. Some people say he never forgets a damn detail, um, and, and on and on, and I think uh, I'm sporadic in that. Some things I never forget, other things I do. Uh, but, but I guess it comes off OK, or so people tell me. Thank you for the psychoanalysis. I probably <laughs> said more than I wanted to. OK. <laughs> yeah, uh, could you talk? Uh, capital is one of the, the, the most diverse uh, colleges in New England. Diversity uh, that exists here. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your uh, your commitment to diversity throughout your career and how that, uh, assuming that you have been, okay, I know you, uh, and so this idea of and how that manifests itself in some of the, the achievements that you're most proud of uh, as it relates to diversity commitment and that. When I stepped down from the presidency. And I got a zillion emails and phone calls and people making their way to my office. And uh, you've been to my campus, so you know I even lived on campus. The ha president's house was in the middle of the campus and people knocking on my Their door. The president has a house. A house overlooking the ocean. Yeah, he's got a house on campus. Okay, so I what are you saying? <laughs> Yes, it was also a, a beat up old military base yeah. with the leaking roof and the issues in. OK. Uh, uh, so diversity, I, I don't know where to begin. But I said when I got all those emails and people were, you know, my god, you're, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're switching uh, your role. You're, you're eventually moving on, all those things. And I always remember 
one person in particular, there were some who said similar things, but one person came down and sat down with me in my office and gave me some nice gifts and purposely told me what he thought some of my biggest contributions to the college were. And the first or second one that he said related to diversity, that I opened people's eyes up. Uh, you've been there. This is Maine, the whitest state in the union. Uh, not so white anymore around the Portland area or the Lewiston area. A tremendous influx of refugees, immigrants, asylum seekers. Not because they resettled there. When I was in, the, in, in Utica, New York, that was a resettlement area for refugees. That people understood. Portland area is not. Portland is a secondary <coughs> resettlement area because once refugees come from all across the Mideast or regions of Africa, and they land in Texas or California or Arizona or wherever it might be, and there's an active network word of mouth. What's their biggest fear? Safety. They've seen their families murdered. They've been in refugee camps, etc. What's most important to them is safety. And word is out on the vine that Maine is safe. And they come by the droves to Maine and start new lives there in the whitest state of the Union. And it's changed the complexion. 60, or I think it's more than that now, more than 60 languages spoken in the public schools surrounding my main campus. Uh, boy, was that a change for that college. Boy, did we have to res wrestle with some things. But, but I go back much, much earlier. I go back to my, remember I said college was an eye opener for me? I was trying to open my eyes for a few years even before I got to college. I grew up in an environment, I already said, my family wasn't educated. I was so conscious of the educational and cultural gap between my family and so many others in the community, in terms, sometimes in terms of education, sometimes in terms of diversity. So anyway, that has been my lifelong drive, to get a PhD, to become a college president. That's what fueled me from an early age. But I'm thinking, I went to a, a small uh, uh, school with the same dozen kids in my class from first grade through eighth grade. And when I got to eighth grade, I said to my parents, I need a change. There's a bigger world out there. And I wanted to switch to the great big high school that had a very, not only a very diverse population, but at the time was known for racial strife. And uh, th we're talking, I mean, how old am I? What, what year was it? 70, early, early 70s. Uh, and uh, there, I mean, the terms used at the time were race riots on the TV news. and uh, and major, major incidents. And, and my parents and others were, you want to go where? And I said, there's got to be a bigger world than these dozen kids I've been with since first grade. And I, I was so glad I went there. Because then I walked into, into the issues and the challenges and the opportunities of diversity at an early age. Then as I went on through life, it was different. I told you about immigrants and refugees uh, in, my, in my last college. Uh, uh, frankly, I've always had a mind that diversity, every human dimension or measure of diversity, yes, racial, racial and ethnic and religion and cultural and sexual orientation and preference and gender and uh, physical ability and so many other factors, but also diversity of thought, diversity of background, diversity of approach, political diversity, everything else. If we could fix a few political diversity problems and get people to stop talking past each other in our country right now, it would go a long way. And it's all tied to racial and ethnic and, and everything else. Uh, so many people in higher ed are more sensitive to that. Yet, so many of our higher ed institutions that we see ourselves as welcoming and supportive, yet there are hidden barriers that make it unwelcome. Uh, I could give a bunch of examples, and I feel bad if people are watching on TV or hear me use the same examples again. Uh, but we had the audacity on our campus to have some, a sign outside in front of the chapel on campus, right across from my house. I don't know if you remember the sign. It said, All Faiths Chapel. All Faiths Chapel. What a wonderful universal idea. All faiths welcome in that chapel. Except the pews were screwed to the floor. So when the Muslim students needed a place to pray, they couldn't move the pews to spread their, their prayer rugs. And we didn't have a foot bath for them to wash their feet before they prayed. And I can tell you about our fits and starts to try to accommodate their needs and how it didn't go well in, in, in so many ways. And that was an eye opener uh, for that college. That's such a good example. I, there's more to that one, but in the interest of time. And, and there's other examples. Uh, but I tried, 
uh, faculty, first student diversity, faculty diversity, hiring diverse faculty, why can't we do better? Well, you know, all the real reasons. Uh, they don't apply, there's none available, whatever. But then with the, the immigrants and refugees, it became, uh, and even before that, I can think of previous institutions, visa issues and sponsorship and expense and everything else, and the college doesn't do that. I'm like, why not? Why doesn't the college do this? Why can't the college do this? So I've stepped in at times to try to encourage things like that. Uh, um, on and on, but I, I think it's inherent, if we're gonna be a college, it's inherent in what we do. If we're gonna be a society and a community, it's inherent in what we have to do. Next person who asks a question gets a cookie. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, two cookies. <laughs> two questions, oh my God. No, one at a time. I'll give you half a cookie if you ask. I, I know you've uh, visited five different colleges at this point, and you fielded a number of questions. What is the one question that has stood out for you and why? Oh, questions are like colleges. Everyone is unique, and they all stand out. I mean that. Oh, there have been so many. I can't resist the student at one campus who I don't know how much he researched to find every newspaper article that's ever been written about me and asked me some tough questions, some that were not too flattering. Uh, uh, or, and it was funny because he didn't pick up on, and I mentioned that, uh, you know, my uh, LinkedIn account tells me when people, re when people are looking on it sometimes, uh, you know, people are searching, Googling me all over the place, a lot coming from Connecticut, I get all that. But I said, I, I wrote an article a few years ago about community colleges and humanities. And uh, I get every time someone uh, goes to that archive, I get a notice from the library. So I only got one, one recently uh, that somebody found a reference to that. When I said that to the group, the student was like, how did I miss that? <laughs> but, but anyway, one student sticks out. I guess what sticks out to me, not a question, but series of similar questions of people concerned about changes and trust and input and direction and consolidation and everything else. And I line all those questions up, that similar questions that I received. And I look at, in all of them, there was a level of interpersonal and human respect. Even when people were so angry they wanted to kill somebody, I didn't feel they wanted to kill me. Not yet, I don't work here yet. Uh, but I, I, I upfront tell people, be candid, and people are candid, and I appreciate that, and we can look each other in the eye at the end and shake hands, et cetera. So that series of questions, in my own mind, what sticks out is the varying different ways that people tried to ask me and tell me, there's a lot going on here, and we're skeptical. But we want to do the right thing, but we can, but we can't, etc. And the variations that I heard on that, that's what sticks out to me most. Yes? Hi, I'm Marsha Paul Davis, uh, interim dean of student affairs. Um, this is a two-parter. Two cookies. <laughs> um, what is your philosophy on first year success and first year experience courses? And do you feel those courses belong in a core, in a core curriculum gen ed um, program? Uh, I don't know the specifics. I'm open to arguments uh, on the specific of that one, the last part of your question, whether it should be a, a core curriculum or not. I know that I, uh, as president, we, uh, our version of a first year experience course, we mandated uh, during my time, and it wasn't mandated before, so if, to call that part of the core curriculum, we made it part of every curriculum, uh, on and on, so I've done that. I, uh, I don't know the specific situations on the ground, and I want to hear the arguments in every direction. Uh, but you know, first year experience, et cetera, uh, paying homage to uh, John Gardner. Uh, and uh, I have met with him several times. I uh, drove him a long way to an airport once years ago. And uh, I have a lot of respect for everything that it is. It's student, it, it, first of all, it came before so many other things. It's a predecessor, a forerunner, achieving the dream and pathways and, and so much. And there, there's some overlap in perspective. And, and, and the, the present and the future are built on the past, on the shoulders of things like this. So I believe in a lot of it. There's one hurdle I can never get over in my own mind, in my own approach. And that is 
tell me what the heck is a first year for a community college student. If I were at a traditional four-year institution, and they'd say, well, it's the first year. Or they'd say, it's X number of credits. I don't, given the realities of, of today's community college students, I do not know how to mark the start and the end, let alone the middle. Do they start when they show up on our campus the first time, the fourth time, when they took a course in high school? Uh, I spoke with a student at one college completing her degree after three attempts spread over 20 years and finally finishing her program. Uh, on and on. I just don't know what first year means. So many students, you know, the first year in one program, first year in a different program, first year at one college, first year online, first year in high school. I just, you know, I don't distinguish. I mean, yes, there are differences in experience and expertise and students more comfortable. I do think there are clearly basics that students who are bewildered by the transition to college and need to feel more comfortable and not, aren't going to understand words like matriculate or even bursar uh, and things like that and have to find safety and comfort, especially underrepresented students uh, and cultural differences and needs. But somehow, there's as much respect as I have for all the good that's been done, a student is a student, whether they've been with us full-time, part-time, online, in high school, they're here, they come back. It's the same. I'm reminded, somebody said to me today, you like quotes, don't you? But one that pops in my head right now is George Bernard Shaw, who said, the only man who acts sensibly is my tailor. He takes my measurements anew every time he sees me. I don't care if I've seen that student every semester or not. Where are they and what do they need? Maybe they've been through a crisis. Maybe they're reoriented may, and need to be reoriented. So, so that's my one hurdle. Otherwise, a lot of respect, and I'd love to. It's a student success measure and a good one. Yes? Um, Maya Jagger, interim, <coughs> interim academic dean here at So I have a question about faculty. So at Capital, we have two faculty separate unions within the same faculty body. And some of the campuses in our system have a single union, and others are like ours with two. What's your experience working in this type of environment? And have you had experiences in an environment where you have multiple unions living in? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, the three community colleges I've worked with in my career, Every one of them has had collective bargaining units and, and unions. Uh, it's range between, I think, two unions and five unions per campus. Uh, sometimes it's been, they've been local unions with negotiations at the local level. Sometimes they've been system-wide or statewide. I've been in every mix of it. Most importantly, I welcome unions to the table, certainly when it comes to terms and conditions of employment. That's what they exist for. So, and there's no getting around that. You can't violate a contract. You have to negotiate in good faith, all those other things. Uh, you have to have labor management committees, which I've often co-chaired, uh, in order to resolve issues. Even if it's at a statewide level, those have to be resolved often at the local level. So all of that. Uh, and, uh, but I welcome union leadership and other union members to the table in a lot of other ways. I think it's part of shared governance. Maybe not formally in the bylaws of the faculty senate. It might be, it might not be. Uh, and different colleges do this different ways as far as standing committees and union leadership or whatever. Some do a lot of it, some do none of it, and everything in between. But what I mean is both formally and informally. Unions, and especially union leaders, are part of the culture. And I don't know if I said in this group, I've been seen so many today, but uh, I love the quote uh, from the old boss of mine used to say, I don't know where he got it from, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. And who contributes more to the culture of a college? than union leaders and members. So I don't want to deal with any part of the college, any decision, any prospective issue, whatever. I want to hear from and interact and engage with unions on anything before the college. So formally, I've done things uh, such as uh, created what we call the leadership council. Leadership council was anybody who had anything close to leadership in their title or their role. Once in a while, once a semester or twice a semester, I'd, I'd, I'd call a meeting of the leadership council. And that included union leaders, and administrative leaders, and faculty leaders, and governance leaders, and if you wanted to call uh, uh, department uh, uh, leaders. I was pretty flexible. Sometimes, some folks, how come they have three representatives at your meeting and we don't have two? I said, you want to bring more people? 
because everybody's a leader. But union leaders are an important part of that, and that's part of the culture, and you can't influence the culture and move the college forward without that. So whatever it is, negotiations and strategies or uh, grievances, <laughs> I love, I've been at one college I was at, there were grievances right and left all the time. And I, I was involved in, in resolving a lot of them. Uh, another college I was at, a grievance came forward. The college had not had a grievance in seven years. And it was a riot the way it happened. I was sitting there talking with my boss, and I said, look at this grievance. I don't understand what they're actually saying. The format doesn't make it clear. Is this, is this, is this in the right format? I'd been there about five years. The grievance came two years before I got there. She'd been there forever. And she looked at it, and she scratched her head. She said, wait a minute. She went to the file cabinet, and she said, uh-huh, I thought so. There hadn't been a grievance in five years. So when it came time for the grievance, the union went back to the last example they had, which was seven years before, and they copied the format. My boss remembered there was a mistake in that format seven years ago, and they copied the mistake. That just shows how some different colleges dealing with, in this case, grievances, but different climates and collective bargaining and inclusion of, 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 of union leaders and membership. There's different ways to approach it, and I value the input, and I think that's part of moving the culture and the college forward. I said a lot. Did that answer your question, or are you looking for something else? OK. Yes? Hi, Margaret Alice Pina, Director of Financial Aid. In your experience, what is the key to developing a good team? Respect, honesty, valuing difference, difference in skills, different in approach, common goals, which don't come out of the sky. And you don't just say, OK, yep, yeah, we're all going to go after X common goal. Common goals and common strategies and to get to them come about a lot of back and forth. That involves a lot of listening and respect and candor. And you can't do anything without others, without teamwork and collaboration. It means, it means playing down competition, internal competition at least. And somebody, someone said there's no I in team. It means not everything has to be your idea. Even your ideas don't have to be your ideas. They can be shared. Yes? Um, one of the, my question is one that I've heard quite a few people bring up as we were discussing the, the three regional um, vice president positions. It's our understanding that the regional VPs will not have direct support staff. So we're wondering what, and I'm wondering what your challenge, what you see as a challenge in this or? Uh, I was asked at the system office, where do I want my office to be? Would you want your office to be at the system office, at one of the campuses? Where would you want your office to be? And I said to the folks at the system office right off the bat, I would not want my office to be at the system office. However, I'm, I'm getting to, to the specific. However, I said, I want to be comfortable in the system office, just like I was in system offices in previous jobs. I want to be able to bop in in the middle of the day and have the folks in the, the system office make a joke about, Ron, your office is free. It's on the left side of the coffee pot or there's an unused conference room, you can go camp out and be comfortable in that environment, but I don't want an office at the system level. At my last two jobs, I had two campuses each. I had two offices in each of those last two jobs. When I had two campuses, I could have two offices. When I have five campuses, I don't think I can have five offices. My office is going to be in my car on my cell phone. Uh, I know there's no support staff. I tried to, in an earlier group today, this came up, how are you going to operate without support? And I started to lead into an answer. I said, whoa, that sounds too much like I'm going to borrow yours. <laughs> because I know whoever I'm talking to already doesn't have enough support and already has too much to do. And I'm not going to borrow other people's. However, I only do my work through teamwork and collaboration. And I'm not going to be doing a lot on my own. So whatever I'm into, I'm going to be sharing with you or somebody. And I hope that as you invest in the efforts that we do together, you might be able to tap some support. That doesn't mean an administrative assistant that's sitting outside your office, because probably those went away long ago for most people. Uh, but somehow, 
we just figured out. That doesn't mean I want to add anything else to anybody's plate. It's not about doing more. You've been doing more and more and more with less, less, less. And maybe this is a cliche too already. We've got to do different. So whatever. I'm pretty comfortable in my car with my cell phone. I've learned how to say, hang on a minute. Let me go check my calendar on the same darn phone. And if I lose you, I'll call you back. I do a lot of that. Now, again, I do want to have an office somewhere or offices somewhere. I could picture myself on a couple, with an office on a couple different campuses and purposely trying to spend more time on the, on the three other campuses where my office isn't. Have I said it all? Or is there anything else you want to throw at me? Yes. Since you've been to all 12 campuses um, and have gotten similar questions and have heard and seen 12 different varieties of everything, what advice would you give us here at Capitol? There's a lot at stake. Everything's at stake and we're playing for keeps. We're trying to sustain values and contributions that are, I believe, the most meaningful and best, best potential for communities, colleges, and society. There's so much at stake here. We can't get this wrong. Did you say advice? Was that the word you used? Don't blow it. <laughs> you know, I uh, don't make it a win-lose. Don't give in to that. Don't let anybody lose. This has to be a win-win. Teamwork, like you said a moment ago. This has to be done collaboratively through teamwork, and we all have a lot to learn from each other. Because together we know a lot more than anybody does individually. And in this thorny situation, it's not going to be perfect, it's not going to be pretty, but it can be more perfect or more pretty if we collaborate and listen and bring forth the better angels of our nature and try to get practical and realize what's possible and what's not, and, that, uh, and stop the need to win, in some, whether it means yes or no. The answer is neither. The answer is we have to do this together, or else we'll blow it like TV news. And this is too important. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that it's been brought up in, in other earlier meetings you know, that one of the concerns that we have about consolidation is the fact that we're bringing in another level of management, essentially, which is going to cost more money, which we were trying to get away from. And I just, I look at you step in, potentially stepping into this and, you know, like you touched on earlier, it's going to be, you know, find a way to work with it, but it just, trying to figure out how to fill my thought. Um, you're stepping into a big can of worms, you know, just, it's, we've got this vicious cycle with lower enrollments, we've got higher costs, less income, and now this consolidation. And we look, you know, like I brought up earlier, the main, which, from the article I read, they consolidated, it really didn't help any because they had another level of administration. I don't, so, Maine, even the university system, didn't really consolidate. They consolidated one campus that was falling apart very tiny under another one. Uh, but that was it in terms of accreditation. But that was it. There have been attempts to consolidate that have failed years ago. And there's been some pressure to consolidate and to get finan chief financial officers to report to the system office instead of the individual campuses. That raised concerns about accreditation. So they kind of backed into the same situation that you're in. And as far as I know, that's what they're looking at. But it's not that they consolidated and then there were problems. I mean, there, there might be plenty of problems. Um, but the, anyway, the, so. Yeah, I just, it's, we sometimes struggle to see that, OK, we have these problems individually. Now we're going to group them together with another person. But what is that actually really going to do for the system? And you coming into that, these are our questions that we're Sure. Finding. It's just, I don't see, you know, where this is actually going to help or how you're going to deal with the input that you're receiving from each individual college that has these concerns. It just
Let, let me walk right into the middle of that with a concrete piece you mentioned. And I think what you were saying, which is a big legitimate question, how is adding another layer of bureaucracy going to help an already overblown system? Well, let's look at the history. Nobody dreamed up and said they wanted three regional presidents. I think what happened was Ojekian and others saw that if we're going to avoid closing campuses, we've got to do something. They believe that not everyone agrees with, that, that consolidation, first of all, I don't think it, people object to students first. I've heard some real angry responses to, to the irony of calling it students first. That one I understand, but what gets me more is I don't think consolidation is the right term. I think changing the status of accreditation, seeking a change in accreditation, and you might call that a euphemism or soft peddling, but that's actually what is happening. I'm not seeing consolidation, regionalization maybe, but I'm not seeing colleges mashed together and, and, and merging, and we might differ on that. But anyway, how does adding another layer of bureaucracy with my salary, and at least there's no support staff, but you know, it's expensive. How does that help? Nobody asked for that at the beginning. I think the way it happened and played out is there was a plan to uh, not regionalize, but unify one college. And there's still the first plan and second plan have that in common. But based on the consultation with, ne with Niask Nechi, they felt that was not realistic and that more administrative support was needed in the middle. And that's how these positions were created. That's my understanding, whether people might differ on that, but that's my rough understanding of how it came about, that this is a necessary step. And, and this is what is a little more nuanced, and people might say it's baloney, but I, I don't know how clearly I said it in this group, but I do not see it as a powerful role that makes decisions and hands them down. I see the role as a communicator, an interpreter, a translator, a sponge, a cushion, a reframer that goes back and forth, up and down and sideways in the colleges, in the communities, around the, each campus, etc. And that's what I can help with the overall profit. And so I guess what I'm saying in part is that I'm a necessary evil. Because there's a plan whether you like it or not, but Nechi says you can't get to that plan, it's not realistic unless you have something else. Is that a whole other layer of bureaucracy? If you want to see it that way, I can understand that. I don't see it that way because I don't think of myself as a bureaucrat or a, a power position or power person. I see myself as that interpreter, translator, facilitator, cushion, et cetera, to try to help everybody come together and help a big plan come about in a way that preserves what it should and takes advantage and reframes as it should and can divide it, work with everybody to have the wisdom to separate into those categories. Let me end by saying, I've just visited five colleges today and 12 colleges and all, and I feel like I have satisfied very few people with my responses. <laughs> I, I have, I'll confess to you, damn camera, I'll confess to you that uh, even in the cars between campuses, I've said to various people things like, oh, I can't believe that group I just came out of. And if you can find the candidate who has better answers that satisfy more people, please go hire them. Because I, I, I'm beginning to live it with you. I see the problems and what's at stake. And I want to help find solutions, and I don't have them all. And I'm not going to find them all. All I can try to do is work with everybody to get all of us closer to them and try to reconcile those irreconcilables as best we can. That's what I hope for. Thank you. Thank you.